specifically in the STEM fields. I come from a family of STEM graduates. My dad is a civil engineer, my sister is an electrical engineer, and I am a microbiologist. We must provide learning opportunities for them to grow, learn and excel in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. As educators, we need to encourage women's participation so they can follow their passion in a chosen STEM career. Today could be that day that her interest finds love and she launches her journey towards that STEM education. Welcome, Dr. Ellington, and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to. Thank you, Dr. Morales, for that warm welcome and your continuous support to the faculty, staff, and students of the TCC Connect campus. All right. This evening, our speaker is Dr. Joretta R. Ellington, who is and has become a trailblazer of her generation. Joretta Ellington, PhD, is a senior technical manager for Evnock Oil Additives, a specialty chemical company. She holds multiple degrees in mechanical engineering from Prairie View A&M University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and a doctorate in systems engineering from the George Washington University. She also earned an MBA from Indiana University Kelly School of Business. Joretta has over 20 years of engineering experience in the automotive and oil gas industries and holds several US, European, and Asian patents. In her spare time, Dr. Ellington loves to travel. She is a believer that you do not learn everything in life through a textbook and the experiences you gain through travel are everlasting. Joretta is a wife, mother of three sons and resides in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Joretta Ellington to the screen. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, I have my camera on for a second just to say um, I'm, I'm glad to be here, but I'll turn the camera off so I can share the presentation without any problems. OK, hopefully you all are able to see this OK. Yes, we are. All right, thank you. Well, again, my name is um, Dr. Joretta Ellington. I hold um, degrees in both mechanical and systems engineering. And as previously mentioned, I'm a senior, senior technical manager for Evonik Oil Additives, which is a specialty chemical company. And I'm excited to uh, talk about changing the narrative and um, the and give an example of uh, what what can be done um, for the next generation of trailblazing women. So uh, first, I'd like to talk about how I got to where I, where I am in my role. Um, I loved um, asking the question why all the time as a as a young kid and. Um, always wondered how things worked, um, how we can make them better. Um, and I liked math and science. And so uh, a counselor told me that it would be, I would be a good engineer. At the time, I didn't know what that was, but I figured I'd roll with it since, okay, I, I can I can use my, my love for math and science. So I started um, my undergraduate career at Prairie View A&M University in Prairie View, Texas. And there I majored in mechanical engineering. I was able to um, take advantage of uh, being in the different clubs like Society of Women Engineers and National Society of Black Engineers to kind of get an idea of what 
are some of the areas of opportunities for a mechanical engineer. Um, I, I realized that I liked um, product development and innovation. So once I graduated from Prairie View, I moved to Massachusetts to attend MIT. Um, there in my master's thesis, it focused on product development and um, product architecture definition. So I remember back then as a researcher, I uh, probably dating myself, but I went and bought like 50 Sony Walkmans, uh, the different kinds that they had back then. And we took them all apart to see uh, what kind of architecture was on the inside of them. And we learned that Sony only used about three different architectures, but they were able to make over 100 different types of Sony Walkmans. And so I was able to use that knowledge um, there uh, for my employer who was sponsoring my uh, graduate tuition, and that was General Motors, and and helped to work uh, with them on taking what we learned from the Sony Walkman and how that can be used uh, to make multiple vehicles using um, a few different architectures that will help to be more efficient and to save money. My last two degrees, I actually um, got while working. Um, so once I, I, I left MIT, I went to work for General Motors. And along the way, I picked up my MBA from Indiana University. And then about nine years ago, um, completed my doctorate at George Washington University in DC. One of the things um, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, along the way is my very first job once I graduated from um, Prairie View is I went to go build Corvettes and uh, Corvettes are only built one place in the world and that's in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And there I was able to um, rotate through a rotational program through all the different aspects of uh, the operation. So I worked in quality, I worked in um, development, I worked in the paint department, and I actually supervised on the line. What I learned from that role is that representation definitely matters. One of the things that I did as a quality engineer is I actually drove that vehicle every day, you know, back and forth to work and just around doing different activities so that we can offer recommendations on, say, if there's something that can be improved. Well, I would go to work and I would wear dresses or skirts and the Corvette sits really low down to the ground and the door seal was pretty high up. So actually, if you had on a skirt, it would be really difficult to get out of the Corvette with the skirt on because the door seal was really high. And so as a 22 year old, I went into the uh, development meetings and I asked um, if women were actually a target uh, consumer for the Corvette and they said, why, of course. And I said, well, if they are, then uh, we need to do something about how high this door seal is because when a woman gets in it with the dress on, it's very difficult to get out. And lo and behold, as a 22 year old, I was responsible for doing an engineering change. And so the next iteration, they lowered the door seal so that both a man and a woman could get in and out of that vehicle. That made me feel really good. Number one, that I had the confidence to be able to uh, speak up and, and, and say something about it. And number two, to actually see it and that engineering change go through and to know that um, you've left, le I've left a mark there. So I think with the diversity of thought, no one ever questioned that because maybe a woman didn't get in and out to do the evaluation. So that just really... Um, you know, reinforce that it is important that you have diversity of thought in the room and you need that that um, that aspect from everyone. And so I know where I sit, um, there's not a lot of, of, of women in engineering. A in my particular area, um, there's over 75 of us in the in the building and I am the only woman um, in my group. And so at oftentimes I think, wow, in, in this present day, we're still, you know, 
trying to encourage people um, to to look at engineering, to consider it and to to know that they can do it. And so that's one of the reasons that I wanted to share today. In the middle, you see a, a, a photo. This is one of the plaques that's on my wall in my office. It's one of, I think it's the plaque from my first US patent that I was able to get. And really what's interesting about this is um, this patent is uh, dealing with, we're trying to look for different, um, different components that can be used together to put into an engine oil that will help to reduce the amount of friction inside of an engine. And that helps to um, improve your fuel fuel efficiency. So everybody, especially now, you think about high gas prices, that that is something um, that that can be useful and helpful. And that came from um, me coming up with a, a new recipe that can be used that actually showed uh, a market improvement uh, between what was on the market at that time. The last photo is uh, a photo of me looking at some pistons from an engine that I took apart. So in my role, uh, my function is to uh, come up with different recipes for engine oils. And before we put them in actual, we sell them to actual auto manufacturers, they have to be tested and evaluated um, in the field beforehand to make sure that uh, there won't there won't be any additional harm uh, with the new recipe that you put in. So this is actually uh, some of the parts that came from some of those uh, engine uh, testing that was done. And I'll, later on, I'll show a video highlighting some of the results from that particular test. So if we look at, I, I work in engineering research. If you look at what a typical uh, career path for that can be, of course, after you have your high school diploma, one of the, the first things would be uh, to get a bachelor's degree. Now, um, sometimes people uh, after the bachelor's degree, they just go on to get like a professional engineering license uh, because some, some different industries like say an architectural firm or a consulting firm, they would really like for you to have a professional engineering license. So some stop at from the bachelor's to just the professional engineering license. Others could opt to go from the bachelor's degree to a master's degree. And in the master's degree, you could specialize in different areas. For example, with mechanical engineering, you could specialize in uh, aerodynamics, you could specialize in uh, thermal dynamics and heat transfer, or you could look at, um, like in my case, I looked at innovation and product development. And so um, that's also, you know, with with the master's degree, that's, you could do a lot of research um, in that area. And then uh, lastly, you could get the doctor of philosophy or um, the doctor of science or the doctor of engineering. All of those are, are terminal degrees and they could be used. Uh, the differences there are just maybe some of the requirements to be able to call it a, a science degree or an engineering degree or philosophy. And what's, in, what's important to note is that you could go from the bachelor's degree to a PhD without getting a master's degree. Oftentimes that's what people do, but you could also pick up a master's degree along the way. One of the things I found that was really uh, important in school uh, were internships. Actually, with the internships, that's where I was able to decide what I liked and what I didn't like in terms of uh, where my focus would be. So my freshman and sophomore year, I interned with an engineering architectural firm where they focused on doing using AutoCAD and doing a lot of drafting of documents for the uh, building wastewater treatment plants. What I realized then is I was really good in AutoCAD, but I didn't like it very much. And so I couldn't imagine myself doing that um, as a career. So my junior year, I actually um, did a co-op in Dallas, in Richardson, Texas, for Texas Instruments. I worked, it, I worked there for nine months. I worked in the, in the wafer fab. And I uh, was in the e equipment engineering group. 
So we were responsible for going into the uh, wafer fab and we were able to uh, make sure that all the equipment that was used um, to make the, the wafer chips, um, that they were functioning properly and that we were doing maintenance on those things and um, just keeping everything running. So that was really a different aspect of engineering. And I thought it was, you know, really, um, I learned a lot that that year, but I still thought, OK, is there something else? So my senior year, I um, interned uh, with an automotive company and, and there I found um, a lot of interest because in the automotive industry, I mean, things are moving um, really fast and you get to see you know, basically something go from a clean sheet of paper until it ends up um, in the field. And with all of those internships, I was able to have multiple job offers. So I could have gone to the auto aerospace industry or, or the oil and gas industry or the automotive industry. And I ultimately uh, decided to go with the automotive industry to, to start out my career. So if you think about it, I know a lot of times um, people will say, well, what do you do every day or what does a day look like for you? And so I thought about that and I said, OK, what does it look like in one day uh, at work? So what I found is that what we do all the time is solve problems. We find problems to solve. We collaborate with others to solve those problems. And in order to solve those problems, a lot of times we're developing technology and we develop that te technology and we commercialize those products. And so it, it's sort of like uh, you find a need, you come up with an idea, you commercialize it, you invent that, and then you have to patent that so that you have some competitive advantage there. And then you document all of that so that uh, the next uh, team that takes over from you will be able to do that. And so oftentimes in our lab, we work on things on a bench scale, sort of uh, planning for that. And, and then we extrapolate and do plant trials uh, on a factory scale. And so when, when we come up with, um, say, a problem and we want to tackle that problem, we have to come up with a test plan on how we can get data and we have to generate that data. And as we're running through these tests, um, we analyze that data, number one, to see if we have to do any course correction, make any modifications, or number two, just to make sure that everything is going well. And after we have accumulated all of that, we go on to then communicate that data to our internal stakeholders or also to our external customers. So I do a lot of interaction with customers, I work with them. Uh, we understand their trends that are going on in the in the market, and we build a strategy uh, to help them to uh, address what it is they're trying to to tackle. So there's a lot of managing of product projects. I lead those projects. Um, I direct teams to uh, work on particular things. In industry, we have different committees. Um, I chair committees. Um, in, in my role, I actually am the voice that goes to Capitol Hill and advocate our position um, for when we're trying to uh, come up with what the next uh, generation category of specifications should be in terms of oil. Um, I constantly have to learn and relearn things. I read a lot of uh, journal articles. Usually when I'm on an airplane, I'm reading uh, a journal magazine called Lubes and Greases. It talks about the latest and greatest in our industry, and that helps me to stay abreast of what's going on. I take classes for new things like, uh, you know, electric vehicles are now, you know, going to be the thing that's most um, looked at for the future. So I take a lot of classes on, you know, what does that look like and what does that mean for us? Um, I attend seminars and trade shows, and I always, um, every year, have to present my new research at different um, technical conferences. Actually, I have one coming up in a few weeks uh, where we're going to talk about some of the research that we, we did last year. So in that, um, I'm all, 
also mentoring, teaching, coaching, and particip participating in different groups uh, where we have interns come in, you try to help them out, um, and uh, co-ops, and we bring in customers into our building and we teach them about the lubricant industry and how to be safe and how it can apply into their market. So there's a lot of, when I thought about uh, engineering, I didn't know I was going to have to do so much in terms of communicating um, on a regular basis. But a lot of that um, happens because we do internal presentations for our internal stakeholders and we also communicate externally to our customers. So on any given day, I have meetings and more meetings. I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with my team. Um, I have global meetings. So I work for a German company. So I am oftentimes on a call at 6 a.m. so that I can be on with my team in Singapore as well as my team in Germany. And so we rotate on who has to get up early. Uh, but I do global uh, meetings and then I meet with the lab on a regular basis, uh, working when we're communicating, um, generating that data. I try to stay in tune with the lab. And then there's regular touch points with our customers. So that's a typical what happens in the day on a typical day. Next, I'm going to uh, showcase um, a 90 second video. It um, summarizes the work I just did on a taxi cab field trial. And in that taxi cab field trial, we ran that trial in Las Vegas. Um, so what happens is when I come up with a new formula, before it can go in a regular vehicle, we test those vehicles, we test those oils in taxi cabs. And the reason we choose Las Vegas is because uh, their taxi cabs run 24 hours a day. Uh, they, are, they have extreme heat um, and they have a lot of stop and go traffic. All of those things extensively put a lot of stress on the oil. So if we can put it in those taxi cabs and it does it does well, we know that then we can present that data to a manufacturer. So basically what I did is I went to the dealership, bought nine brand new vehicles, had them converted into taxis, took drained out all of the engine oil fluid that was in the vehicle when we got it, and put all of the formulas in that I made, and we ran those taxis for 100,000 miles. It took about 18 months to do. At the end of that 18 months, we took them apart, every single one of them, and looked at each part one by one. And so I just have a 90 second video that just kind of highlights that, and then I'll summarize.
So why should you become an, an engineer? In my case, I'm mechanical or systems. That's because we need you. Um, you know, it, it's a it's an industry that I think sometimes people shy away from because they think maybe I'm not good in math or I'm not good in science, but those are things that can be worked on. And we definitely need people, especially women. And what I appreciate about it is the adventure is different every day. And I get to make a lot of cool things that people love. Um, I get to sort of like solve puzzles on a daily basis. So I love to solve mysteries. I love, you know, wondering how things work. And so how can we make them better? And if you have that kind of passion, then definitely become an engineer because I think it will be a career that is rewarding and you will feel like you make a difference. And that's my goal. Um, today was to just kind of showcase like a little snippet of what I've done and how you can navigate through the different areas. And even if there's one area that you're not particularly sure you like, there's other areas that you can look into and find something that is definitely something that you can be passionate about. So thank you for taking the time to listen. And if there's any questions, I'll take those. Thank you, Thank Dr. you Dr. Lincoln, for sharing, for sharing your, your, your path, changing the narrative, and being a trailblazer, trailblazer for other women to follow. This was absolutely amazing. Definitely gave me a different perspective um, as I look at mechanical and system engineering. Um, do we have any questions for for Dr. Ellington this evening? Oh, there's looks like there's quite a bit in the chat. Uh, yes, I see one. Um, well, the first question I see is what what is the qualification to be an engineer to be in to be in engineering, and is engineering doing the same work with mechanics? As a mechanic. Oh, I see yeah. that. Um, so the qualification to be an engineer is to get a degree in engineering. So there's different um, aspects, um, uh, mechanical systems, chemical, electrical, civil, aero, astro, biomedical, all of those things. We have to take some core classes and then about junior year, you branch off into um, other areas to specialize in your particular field. And is engineering doing the same work as a mechanic? Um, no, engineering is not doing the same work as a mechanic. Uh, so what I was doing in that in that role um, is I developed the engine oil that goes into that um, in that engine. And we take the engine apart so that we can see what that oil did to the engine. So I actually had, I, I wish I had those uh, here with me, but I actually had in one of those, um, one of those cars that I rode, one of the taxi cab drivers said that he thought that the spark plugs needed to be uh, changed in that taxi because it was losing a lot of power. I actually drove that particular taxi and it was sluggish. It would start off like sort of like, I think I can, I think I can, and then it would open up. And, and But we looked at the spark plugs and they looked great. So it's like, well, it wasn't a spark plug issue. But when we took that engine apart at the very end, two of the four pistons, which the pistons are designed to give you power, two of those four pistons were clogged up and they were stuck. And so because they were stuck, that engine was only running with two pistons, which means it was half the amount of power that it should have been. But we couldn't see that until we took it apart. So an engineer designs and um, problem solves to figure out, you know, okay, we designed it to be this way, but 
it's not working that way. Sort of a mechanic is taking apart and putting together that kind of thing. We actually would uh, go a step further and develop it and um, give you the instructions on how to put it together. Great, the next question is, where can I find engineering internships? Well, um, so a lot of uh, a lot of the internships can happen. I don't know if you're familiar with, like I, I mentioned, Society of Women Engineers, National Society of Black Engineers, uh, ASME, all of those uh, different um, organizations. They have big career fairs where you can find um, engineering internships. Um, actually, and you can reach out to each of the companies because they usually are hiring interns around the same time. And you can reach out, uh, like look on LinkedIn um, and for uh, opportunities for internships. And then also, I know like on a, a four-year university, they have a career services office. And a lot of times they'll have some postings there uh, for internships. That's how I got my internships. I got them um by uh going to the engineering conferences and then also going to my career services um uh office in in the university um we have a question that says what inspired you to choose the concentration of mechanical engineering so if i really tell you you might laugh but <laughs> I'll tell you. So I remember I knew I wanted to be an engineer. I wasn't quite sure which kind of engineering. And I remember we were all uh, I was at at uh, Prairie View. We were in line um, getting ready to register. And so I was around, you know, friends and I'm like, OK, what are you going to major in? They're like civil engineering. What are you going to major in? Uh, electrical engineering. What are you going to major in? Chemical engineering. And I was like, nobody said mechanical. So I'm going to do mechanical engineering. So the cool thing is, yeah, that was kind of like unorthodox, but I also picked a mechanical because it's the most versatile. So in a as a mechanical engineer, you have to take electrical engineering classes. You have to take chemical engineering classes. You have to take civil engineering classes. So I felt like it was the most versatile and I've worked in a semiconductor industry. I've worked in the automotive industry. I've worked in the architectural industry and now I'm in oil and gas. So I literally have worked in all of those facets of all of those different classes that I took as a mechanical engineering student. So what are some of the challenges you've dealt with as a woman in a male dominated field and how do you deal with those challenges? So sometimes um, a man wants to over talk the woman. So thankfully I have six brothers. So I'm sort of used to, you know, the male domination there, but I just am firm and confident in my, in my responses, right? Um, if we're in a meeting and we're all talking, I will make sure that my voice is heard and that I, you know, speak up. I, I remember being a young intern, I was afraid to speak up in the room. Like, you know, uh, I, I, I rode around in that Corvette for a while, struggling to get out of it in a skirt. But then I said, well, if I don't say anything, then how will they know? And so I found my voice and I, I make sure to just be confident in my responses and they respect that. So what made you, persevere. what made you persevere getting through several years of college? Okay, so I think what made me persevere is having a good study group, a good uh, set of people to study with, um, because what happens is, especially when I was at MIT, let's just say that was a really hard place. And um, they would give us an, a, a whole lot of uh, work to do and not a lot of time to do it. And I really believe they did that because they're forcing you to collaborate with folks. And so you can't get through it 
in a silo by yourself in the corner. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way in my industry. If I have an issue, I make sure to collaborate with my colleagues, say, hey, I have this problem. Have you seen that in your area? Rather than sit and try to solve it on my own. So I think to get through all of those years in college, even from undergraduate all the way through my doctoral program, there were many times that I felt like I was going to quit but it was always a colleague or a, a friend that's like, no, keep going. We got this. And so I think that's what you should look forward to uh, making sure you have is a good group of people to kind of go through it together. So what is one thing you wish young women knew about engineering to prevent them from shying away from this field? I wish young women knew that they are just as smart as any man out there. I, I think somewhere around seventh grade or so, young ladies think they're not as smart as a, a guy. They don't think they can do it. And I think that's all just confidence. And um, it is, it is something that you have to tell yourself that, you know what, I, I, I used to have to look in the mirror at myself and say, you are just as smart as they are. And so you will not quit. You are just as smart. And it's just believing that. And I think that's 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 what I would want a young woman to know is that you are what you believe. And as long as you believe you can do it, you can. That was real good. Um. Are there any other questions? I think I've gone through all of the questions. I want to make sure I didn't skip anyone because every question is important. And I think I've gone through all of the questions. Does anyone else have any other questions for Dr. Ellington regarding her path? Um, any advice? For those who are maybe not interested in engineering just interested in going into the STEM field. Do you have any advice for them for where they are now? So let me restate that. Do you have any advice for our students for where they are now who are interested in not necessarily engineering, but just going into a STEM field? Well, uh, I would suggest uh, that whatever uh, career that you're interested in, in terms of a field, whether it's science or engineering or math um, or technology that you look at, look at the curriculum that is required to, to go into that field so that you can make sure as you're setting your schedules and taking your classes that you're able to make sure you are adequately prepared by taking the necessary uh, prerequisites to help you to get there. I know that when I was, uh, I was particularly strong in uh, math, so I was actually help, helping to tutor a lot of students when I was an undergrad. And there were some that were really challenged um, with, uh, say, calculus or calculus two or three, and it, it, it was because they didn't take it in high school. And um, so it's like, you know, playing catch up. And so if you know you want to be in a technical type uh, field, I would just make sure that you're looking at what's required to get there and then make sure you're taking that to help it, uh, you know, be a better transition as you move on to the, the higher level courses. Good, good, good. Um, I do not see any other questions coming about and I know we're short. Um, I guess we have 20 more minutes left, but you know, if we don't have any more questions. We just don't have any more questions. Uh, before we end, I want to say for the students who are here, thank you for attending. Um, it was stated if you do attend, you get attendance credit and Professor Mertens has provided that link. So please make sure you um, click on that link so that you are able to get your attendance. Um, lastly, Dr. Ellington, we thank you for being an inspiration, not just to our future engineers, but to all of our 
interest of students wanting to go into the STEM field and specifically for our young women, the young ones who are out there ready to just make a difference in the next generation. So we need you, we need you guys. So we'd love to have you out there. So we thank you. Thank you all of our students. Hopefully you were able to take away some nuggets that you heard from Dr. Ellington and you were able to apply them to what you are doing as you finish out the rest of the semester. So again, thank you to everyone and have a good evening. Thank Bye -bye. you.